so hi everyone and uh, it's very nice to see all of you uh, and welcome to our November coffee chat and also the very last coffee chat of 2001. Um, we plan to be back in February of 2022 uh, and meanwhile uh, get in touch with, the, me, with me if you have something you would like our fabulous community's input on for a session next year. So my name is Mari Rustan and I'm the marketing director and product manager of Iris BG. Uh, Eivind Rustan, who's the founder and CEO of Iris BG, is also here today. On today's uh, agenda, the focus will be on sustainability and probably not for the last time as the topic, it's the topic we find very important. Uh, we will not have a community challenge on the agenda, but a community contribution Rather, uh, it's brought to us by Harry Watkins, the director of St. Andrew's Botanic Garden, Gardens in Scotland. We will round off his presentation with a Q&A, so if you come to think of any questions for Harry while he's speaking, you're welcome to add them uh, to the chat, starting with the capital Q, and we will address them later. Uh, and if type, time permits, we will have an open chat at the end. So this is a recap for many of you. Um, I just want to say a few words on the coffee chats. Uh, the idea with this format is that we would like to offer you an arena where you can connect with peers and have a chat about RSVG and your daily work with your collection. Hopefully you make some new connections and together we might become a bit wiser. So to get an idea of who's here today, I've created a tiny poll. The majority today here are intermediate uh, a couple of you are novice and a couple of you are advanced. It's a nice balance. And I'm very glad to see that so many of you already are have introduced sustainability initiatives in your garden. As some of you may know, RSPG are already active members of two communities, uh, the APGA in the US and the Plant Network in the UK, Ireland. And in both communities, we are part of sustainability initiatives ourselves. So with the APGA, we are sponsoring and co-hosting the Sustainability Index webinar series. Uh, we'll actually have this month's webinar uh, starting just one hour after this one ends today. Uh, I can share the link to, link to that in the chat later. The topic there today is employee development, diversity and inclusion. and all speakers are members of our community uh, from the Botanic Garden of Smith College, Louis Ginter and Vizcaya Museum and Garden. The segue to our very own presentation right here now uh, is um, that in the role as a creative advisor of the Plant Network podcast, uh, I was doing some research and I came across um, pro a project called uh, the Tangled Bank. And I was very intrigued by this approach to what a botanical garden can be. And since St. Andrew's Botanic Garden is a member of our community, I extended an invitation to their director, Harry Watkins, to join us here today. Uh, and so, yeah, what is the Tangle Bank? I'll let Harry give you all the details himself. I hope everyone can see this screen OK. Um, the Tangle Bank is a project that we're working on in the Botanic Garden looking at ways of teaching and researching evolution. Um, I've got here a question about living systems, degraded ecologies, biodiversity and so on. It's all connected. The, the line or the name of the Tangle Bank comes from Charles Darwin's uh, book on the origin of species, where at the end of it, he talks about this vision of life and its connectedness. And it's a beautiful poetic section. And for us, it's summed up a lot of what we wanted to capture when we talked about evolution. And I guess for a botanic garden, our perspective is perhaps a little bit different to a lot of other botanic gardens who might be joining this call right now, in that our view is that we're focusing less on systematics and more on the interaction between ecology and evolution. So it's a slightly different approach, but nonetheless, hopefully interesting and fruitful for research. If I can take you back in time and space to St. Andrews in February 2020, this is what the garden looks like. And in particular, I want to kind of zoom in on that central area that you can see there. 
I say it's a traditional botanic garden in that you can see there in the top right hand corner, lots of kind of like nursery area and facilities, lots of glass houses. You can see there some woodland areas and big order beds in the middle here, in the center of the screen there, the order beds. And you can see a rock garden and so on. And in February 2020, we faced probably a couple of situations that I guess many people in the botanic garden world faced at the same time as well in that we found that our visitor numbers <laughs> had been falling for a long time and that we hadn't, as a result of kind of investment and business numbers, we hadn't been able to invest in the building maintenance in the way that perhaps would have been ideal. There's lots of old buildings with asbestos, buildings that were built in the 60s. The heating of the glass houses required a lot of gas and therefore had a very high carbon footprint. Um, the ways that ecology and evolution were being taught very much relied on this 1960s perspective of the world and that nonetheless the garden had moved more and more towards a garden that was managed for amenity and horticulture and tourism rather than botanical research and i started my job here in the garden in february 2020 i'd moved here from northern ireland and then as soon as i started work here covid19 arrived and all of these things kind of came together as a series of, well, almost individually existential questions, but they combined to really become quite pressing challenges. And so we took a view and thought, well, all these challenges, they're kind of connected and they perhaps speak to systemic challenges that are, sure, connected through cultural and ecological processes. And so we thought, well, if we're dealing with systemic challenges, the answer is likely to be found in systemic answers, and that's where ecology comes in. And we saw health, public health, plant health, institutional health as being part of this kind of connectedness. So we thought, okay, look, we need an ecological solution to all these challenges. And so before going much further, I thought what would be handy is just a quick recap of ecology as we understand it. And then that might give perhaps a bit of an insight into how we've come to the project such as it is. So there are two factors which limit plant growth. First is stress, and that can be expressed in lots of different ways. That could be drought, it could be flooding, it could be compaction in the root zone, it could be to do with chemical factors like pH, soil pH, but anything really that limits an ability, a plant's ability to photosynthesize and reproduce could be considered a form of stress. And the other fact that limits plant growth is disturbance, by which we mean the removal of part of the biomass of the plant. So that could be, say, in a natural environment, it might be, say, a riverbank where there's erosion. And you see as a consequence of that erosion, like bits of the root structure being removed, or it might be animal predation and herbivory. Um, but it might also be to do with kind of like human influences like mowing or kind of um, soil disturbance by like hoeing, for example. So these two examples of stress and disturbance can be expressed and understood in lots of different ways. But nonetheless, you can put them on a graph and you can start to see combinations on this graph of different conditions for life, whether high stress, low disturbance, no stress, low disturbance, combination of the worst of both worlds. And from an evolutionary perspective, these influences have consequences and have resulted in evolutionary strategies. So where you've got low stress and high disturbance, a good example is like a cornfield, perhaps. And in the UK, we see poppies growing in cornfields. Now, these conditions are, sure, low stress because there's lots of fertilisation and the soil is good for growth, but there's high disturbance. So the only strategy that wins is got to live fast, die young. And plants in this corner of the graph, they just prioritize sex and reproduction above everything else. And a poppy will grow as tall as it needs to grow. It'll reproduce, flower, set seed and die. And that's it. It completes its life cycle in a very short space of time. Just big enough, it'll grow tall enough just to get above the competitors, like the grasses very often, and then away it goes. 
The opposite end of the spectrum is things like this juniper, which have got very thick, dense leaves, thick, dense stems. If you drink gin, you'll know that they've got very thick, dense berries, which flavor gin. Um, they are able to grow very slowly and withstand huge amounts of physiological, climate, biological stress as well. And their evolutionary strategy yeah, is to grow very slowly and withstand everything. Where you've got low stress, low disturbance, that's where I guess the living is easy in many ways, and that's where everyone wants to be. So the strategy from an evolutionary perspective is to outbeat everyone else. And I've got an example here of foxglove tree, the Paulonia tomentosa. And the way that you outcompete everyone else from a plant's perspective is to grow tall and then wide, suppress everyone else, and then reproduce like crazy. Because you know that all of your competitors have been shaded out or outcompeted in different ways. And then where you've got high stress, high disturbance, there is no viable strategy for life because the turnover in the environment is so fast and the conditions are so stressful. So what does that mean? Well, evolutionary, from an ecological perspective, it means that there are viable strategies and that these trade off against each other. So plants, from an evolutionary perspective, have to make decisions about how they allocate resources nutrients in order to become cool and reproduce and grow and establish healthy populations. Now, the reason I'm talking about all this is because it reinforces the point about trade-offs. Here, from a plant economics point of view, it becomes very clear that you can't do all three of these things. You've got to choose whether to become a stress tolerator or a competitor or a rural. And this is all laid out in work set out by Phil Grime in the 70s. Now, I should say that this isn't necessarily a complete theory or resolved in any way, but it, I find it a really useful bridge to understanding evolutionary strategies. And within this kind of conceptual framework, there are lots of different and useful ways of understanding the mechanisms for life and the trade-offs that result. And they check out broadly, like annual herbs tend to fall in this bottom right-hand corner of the triangle. Or annual herbs like foxgloves, digitalis, for example, which I'm sure lots of people are familiar with, have a slightly different ordination. But this rubric is a really useful framework for understanding variation in life. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, I started to wonder in February, could this evolutionary trade-off matrix be used to understand organizations? So the Bank of England, for example, is a bank which will probably be around for a while longer. It's been around for ages. I would have thought of that as a very conservative organization. So I've put that down in the bottom right, bottom left hand corner here, the stress tolerators. They can withstand all kinds of financial crashes, that kind of thing, but nonetheless, they persist. Um, Nike would be an example of a competitor who, I suppose Amazon would be another good example, someone who is highly competitive, outcompetes everyone else, and then smothers the competition to prevent um, kind of other people trying to steal their business. And then the bottom right hand corner, the Rudeville, the equivalent of the poppies would be like a little pop-up shop who sells trainers for six weeks and then disappears or like a little pop-up coffee shop. And this became a really useful thought exercise to think, well, can we apply ecology and evolution to us in the garden? And then we started, well, actually I started then thinking like, can I apply it to my friends too? Can I see who is a competitor, who's going to live fast, die young, who's very conservative by nature? And that was quite an interesting thought exercise too. But nonetheless, it started to become a useful thought exercise to think, well, look, if we're a botanic garden who is faced by lots of challenges, there are decisions we've got to make that respond to the very pressing, the here and now. And there are decisions we've got to make that cascade out to longer term decisions. Like What's our research mission or what's our conservation mission going to be like? And how do we attract visitors over a long period of time? These questions, the short, the medium and the long term, all started to fall into a kind of a framework of thinking, well, they've all got implications for each other. If we want to invest in visitors for a short period of time in the near term to drive income, to drive investment, then that's going to require an allocation of resources away from where they are at the moment from say a nursery and into project work. 
So, we settled on this free phase project called the Tangle Bank, where we would try and reframe the Botanic Garden's mission, in a way, into a world of ecology and evolution, and try and recapture a sense of conservation objectives, okay? moving away from the display and moving away from the horticulture and really focusing on what botany means in the 21st century. So there are three phases to the Tangle Bank and there are three areas where it operates. Well, the first phase is to remove and we took some pretty big and almost irreversible steps in this process. The first one is to remove lots of things from the garden. We turned off the gas that comes into the garden and we've started decommissioning all of the glass houses. We have removed the order beds where we had all of the systematics display of all the plants and their little one by two and a half meter. And we removed a large part of the shrub. These, yeah, are almost irreversible decisions or irreversible without um, a new and major injection of cash. We've begun a process of strategic design to develop a new conservation plan. So a lot of botanic gardens have collection plans. And we're not doing that, we're developing a conservation plan instead. And I use those words quite deliberately, and we can come to that perhaps later on. But the message there is that we're moving away as a botanic garden, away from saying, this is a Magnolia sibboldii, and this is a Magnolia sargentiana, and this is a Magnolia sinensis, for example, to trying to create populations of plants instead. By that, I mean not just having three or four individuals or accessions of an individual taxon, but to actually having self-sustaining populations of plants instead of having individuals. And then the third phase here is to do some staging things within the Tangle Bank, creating three opportunities for novel ecosystems to establish in the garden that replicate environments that we see in Fife in our part of Scotland. And we've chosen those three habitats, reflect habitats in five that are particularly threatened by biosecurity risk and climate change. And we are in this process recognizing that they're not the habitats themselves, perhaps, but rather replicas of those habitats. And they have this degree of novelty, not only because we're making them from new, but also because they respond to new and novel evolutionary pressures which these habitats didn't see quite in the same way elsewhere in Fife. So what does this look like? Well, it means a lot of removal and a lot of replacement and staging. So on the left-hand corner here, you can see the door diagram of the garden, taking away a lot of shrub beds. So the garden had a lot of examples in this area, in this left-hand patch over here, I should say. So I'm, I'm kind of pointing at my screen, which probably isn't much use to everyone. But if we were in a lecture theatre, I'd have a pointer, and that would be a lot more obvious to you. But if you look on the left-hand side of that lump there, you can see that there are kind of lots of blobs. These are trees, and the kind of mid-green kind of colours are, are large blobs. These were shrubs, and we had lo there lots of like uh, Lonicera and Viburnum, Syringa, Berberis, Cloniaster, Hydrangea. In these collections, we had lots, lots of kind of like one of this, one of that, one of this, one of that, one of that one. And the challenge we had was that, frankly, although we knew broadly what the species were and have been trying to verify them, we didn't really have any accession information about where these individuals had actually come from in terms of populations. We might have known, for example, that it came from a particular nursery or from a particular botanic garden, but really we had no way of understanding the provenance of these individual plants in relation to the ecosystems where they'd originally come from. So from a biological perspective, they had conservation perspective, they had a degree of value, but quite limited value, if I can put it that way. And so what we've done with all of these plants is reordered them and try to understand and verify their identities and then propagate them, create backup versions of them in the glasshouses in our nursery, and then take them away and replace them with shrub beds. And we've done lots of tree felling as well in this area. But the idea here is to create, instead of shrub beds and shrub gardens, we've tried to create what we're calling like a wood meadow, whereby you've got climax trees or highly competitive trees at wide spacings. So when I say wide, I mean, I'm like 15 meter spacings, 20 meter spacings. 
under which lots of meadows can establish. So the idea here is to kind of create conditions where we can have lots of grassy forby plant communities, broadly native, mostly native, native to Fife, I should say, but over time create the conditions for long-term research experiments to investigate how meadows, wood meadows in Fife, respond to climate change. So we're going to be doing lots of monitoring, lots of census recording of the plants in this area, lots of functional trait data collection, looking at plants of um, looking at parts of plant physiology. And then we'll use the same research techniques of transects, quadrats, physiological data record to look at the next area here, which is on the right hand side, where we've taken out all the order beds, we've replaced them with sand dunes. And we've gone through a similar process of taking out all of the plants in this area after a period of or a process of auditing them, making sure that our databases were as up to date as possible, understanding the collection, and then removing and, and relying on the backup collection then in the glass houses in the nursery. And we're creating sand dunes. And in the sand dune area, we're creating kind of ponds or sand dune ponds, very mobile areas of sand dunes. And looking at how these plant collections can replicate the plants that we see around the coast here in Fife. And it's a totally different way of understanding relationships between plants. Instead of saying like, here is, I don't know, Liriodendron tulipifera. Here is Liriodendron chinensi. And how are they different? We're saying these plants, these populations of plants are going to be moving through the sand dunes. And over time, they're going to do very different things and they'll behave in different ways and really starting to look at evolution from a different perspective. And then in the bottom part of this drawing, we've got the doorstep garden. So where we had all the glass houses, we're going to create a very urban garden that encourages people to understand this botanic garden as part of an urban context. So where we are in St Andrews is in a suburban part of town. And I think it's really important that the botanic garden reflects where it's from. So we're in a suburban part of town, so let's make a suburban garden and look at the evolutionary and ecological pressures that we see in the landscape around us. So we're calling it a doorstep garden. The idea is replicating the botany that we see on our doorsteps. So lots of invasive plants, perhaps lots of garden plants, lots of hard landscaping, lots of driveways. And the challenge for us here, as I suppose elsewhere in the Tangle Bank, will be to think about how we can make this look beautiful at the same time and work with those kind of cultural preconceptions people have when they come to a botanic garden, as well as trying to create a rich opportunity for habitats and also research. So this process of removal is in many ways quite dramatic for us. Here we've got a, quite a large glass house, perhaps our largest glass house. Um, you can see right in front, we've done some chopping down of a tree, but we've also done some quite provocative things like just simply taking all the glass off the glass house. And we're going to turn this into a pergola instead. And we'll be doing a little bit of structural work here to create um, steel wires in the glass house that plants can climb up. But nonetheless, the idea is we'll create conditions for climbing plants to climb up the sides of this pergola where there was glass. There'll be vines and creepers and climbers, that kind of thing. The big strip of the sky running down the middle. And you can see there in the middle of that photograph a, um, a large, well, it's, it's a large magnolia, actually, as it happens, Magnolia solangiana. And it was kind of pushing up against the glass anyway. And now it's just put on a bit of late season growth and is now well beyond the pergola structure. Um, so it's really interesting from a design perspective, from a botanical and horticultural perspective too, it throws open lots of opportunities. And it's quite challenging, I think, for lots of people who have come to the garden for a long period of time to see a glass house with no glass and to try and think about what that means, yeah, horticulturally and botanically. We're using this process of strategic design quite carefully um, to think about what this really means for a botanic garden, about the research questions that we want to ask or the conservation questions that we're going to try and engage in. Because a lot of botanic gardens, I think, feel conflicted with this kind of sense of history of botanic gardens being rooted in this sense of um, colonialism, perhaps, of working 
with places around the world where you go to and you say a colonial network exists and you collect as many plants as you can and you bring them back. And in the 19th century, that's for purposes of um, ethnobotany or kind of cultural exploitation of plants. In the 20th and late 20th century, it's much more to do with ex situ conservation. Nonetheless, going to places around the world, collecting lots of plants, bringing them back for study and evaluation in a different environment. And whilst we have plants from around the world in the Botanic Garden in St Andrews, we've never really done much collecting ourselves at an institution. And so the collection that we have has really been assembled from working with other Botanic Gardens and nurseries and trying to build as much diversity as possible. But now, as we try and develop a new conservation mission, the question is, well, who are we going to work with around the world? And why are we researching what we're researching in the Botanic Garden? And we've had to think about, well, we're a small Botanic Garden and we can't do everything. And in fact, we can't really do much at all. We don't have much money and we don't have much space. So if we're going to do anything, it's got to be really well considered and meaningful and we can't i think go to borneo and get exciting plant orchids from borneo we can't go to brazil and just get lots of tropical plants from brazil or, or whatever or southwest china or, or um wherever it might be we've got to think i think really carefully about who we work with because it's got to be meaningful for everyone and so what we've been doing is modeling the world really from a climate perspective using new research that we're developing in-house, trying to find places around the world where there are similar amounts of rainfall during the year and similar growing seasons. And our idea is that if we can find these places around the world where there are similar climate challenges, can we then develop conversations with places around the world where there are similar habitats within these places and say, look, what are the shared challenges that we're each facing? What are the opportunities that we've got between us to learn from each other or from to develop shared research projects? And so these mapping exercises are throwing up places which are, well, certainly very specific, but also quite unexpected in some situations. And so it's really exciting then to start to develop a picture of the world which looks like a rationale for developing new bridges, as it were, for developing new collaborations and for then going to botanic gardens and plant collections in these places which we see and say we're all land managers or conservationists and saying well look you've got similar pressures from climate change we've got similar pressures what can we learn from each other how can we conserve plants together how can we share resources perhaps and i think that'll be hopefully quite a useful strand for us to to, to develop and so i just pulled out some questions of what some, sorry, I pulled out some images of what these places are starting to look like as we embark on the Tangle Bank project. This is where we're doing the staging work. So this used to be shrub beds and now is lots of grasses. You can see in there as well, lots of um, uh, roots, runners popping up in amongst the grasses. They're not meadows at the moment, but they will become over time. And we've got here, like at the moment, some nice places to have a cup of coffee and amongst it all, but nonetheless, it's starting to function like meadows. Lots of interesting stuff as well coming through from the seed bed. We've got in here the sand dunes that are replacing the water beds, and this is a drawing of what we're trying to do. But here we are building sand dunes, moving plants around, moving sand around. And um, here's Louis on the tractor moving some sand into new locations. And I was a bit apprehensive actually about showing you this picture, but this is in the sand, <laughs> germination, just the other day, starting to take place. So my hope is that over time, these grasses will give way to forbs and orchids and all the kind of locally charismatic plants that we see in our sand dunes in Fife. And here we are in the sand, in the glass houses. This is the view from my office in June last year, top left-hand corner. And then top right hand corner, August this year, then bottom left hand corner starting to take more away. And then bottom right hand corner, this is the view from my office window a couple of days ago. And next year we'll take away the rest of the glass houses. And it's really exciting in a sense to see 
a landscape being revealed where we've had glass houses with tropical collections in them or desert collections or Mediterranean collections, giving way to what will become an urban garden that reflects the habitats and the ecology of, of Fife. And we're doing this in stages. So in the top left-hand corner, we've got what we're calling a meanwhile garden. So this will be, as we work our way through the decommissioning of the glass houses, we'll do this kind of like phased situation where we'll grow lots of kind of like grassy paths and essentially sow lots of kind of like highly floriferous um, flowery mixes. I think probably we could go down a route of kind of quite a pictorial mix, but I think we'll probably have lots of clovers, lots of fabaceae plants, uh, lots of legumes in there, same foins, clovers, that kind of thing. And then ultimately arrive at this situation at the bottom right hand corner um, with lots of kind of islands and stylized beds for planting, but where we'll be able to have lots of hard landscaping with plants climbing through the hard landscaping too. So it should be interesting, but there's a headline figure which I pulled out here for us, which is in this process of changing the garden like this, we've reduced our carbon emissions by 95% which is a significant number because botanic gardens, although we work with plants and we work with green things all the time, botanic gardens aren't necessarily that environmentally friendly, perhaps. Certainly in the botanic garden here in St Andrews, we had to do lots and lots and lots of biological control, biosecurity work on the glasshouses to control um, the pests and diseases you know, that you see in warm and humid environments. We have to do lots of heating of these glass houses. Glass is not a good insulation material. So if you're in St Andrews trying to achieve 12 or 15 degrees centigrade year round, that's very difficult, especially when you've got glass. It takes a huge amount of heating to keep these glass houses warm. So simply just taking away glass houses is making a massive difference for our carbon footprint. <laughs> And there will be lots more findings, I think, that will come through from this as well, down the line to do with how much water we use, when we use the water, and so on. But I think there are lessons as well that we can take, as well as the numbers. One is that this process is requiring courage, courage of conviction. Um, the curator for the Botanic Garden of Edinburgh, Royal Botanic Garden of Edinburgh, came around the other day, and I was talking to him. And I think he was a bit surprised to see what he saw, but he, one of the words, one of the things he said was like, you're very brave to do this. And I don't know if he meant brave and stupid or just brave and go for it, but it really reinforced this idea to me where, well, we're, in a, we're a small botanic garden and we're doing our thing and I haven't really expected to be on anyone's radar. We're just doing what we're doing. And it struck me that actually this does require courage to do because we have had some adverse reactions to this but I think the trick here is to accept the criticism and learn from it but nonetheless better be clear about why you're doing what you're doing and for us it's reducing the emissions it's creating richer habitats it's creating opportunities for research and education so being really cleared eye clear-eyed about why we're doing this I think is, is really important and it helps us keep our focus on on the big picture and the other is to be really clear-eyed about what the trade-offs are. So lots of organisations at the moment are producing sustainability plans where they say, we're going to be net zero by 2030. And in a way, okay, great, net zero is a worthy aim to have. But if you want to become carbon net zero, it's possible to do it much more quickly than that. The question is, what are the implications? For doing that and that's where i come back to that triangle that i pulled up earlier and the ecological evolutionary strategies rudral because you can become a c or an s and an r as an organization it's really up to you to well have the courage of conviction to do it i think but also to understand what do you what are the implications of doing that you know you can get there quite quickly i think but it's going to require trade-offs and it's going to require that economic perspective in order to get there. So I wondered if that's maybe quite a good place to stop for the moment and perhaps open it up for a conversation with people who are working with other botanic collections. Thanks for listening and thanks for your time.